I call this reincarnation of Uncle Jonathan. The one thing that I noticed is that all kids from the North have said the same thing about their father. They were lazy. This really wasn't true. People from another family always saw them in a different way. They had the respect of other people, and you know, that respect is hard to get. A lot of fathers were feared as being mean to their families. That's different. True respect came from the good that they did for their family, unnoticed, but also for their people. Even though it was easy for everyone to just think of themselves as a few people were real leaders and shared what wealth they had and their knowledge. The survival of the village depended on this knowledge. The whites gave advice which always came with a price. A lot of people fell into the trap of thinking that they were sincere, genuine in their concern. The truth that Jonathan passed long if it was asked for was invaluable to the people. Dad really respected Jonathan and had gone up there to Kispiox to help him build his house. Most of the houses were only clapboard houses at the time, two by fours, no tar paper, and shiplap boards as a complete outside wall. However, for Jonathan, they had to put shiplap on the inside walls as well. It was a very modern house. Remember, this was his last house when he lived by himself. It was only one large room with a cot on one end and a round pot-bellied stove with a flat sheet of steel on the top to cook on near one wall. A tea kettle and a coffee pot were permanent fixtures on the stove. A table with two chairs adorned the kitchen. A couple rows of shelves held the dried food and pots and pans above the table. The front room held a rocking chair with an armrest and an apple box on one end as a coffee table. You might wonder what the house had to do with the reincarnation. I was four years old when Dad was helping build the house. Even then I had a photographic memory. Besides it being the first double-lined house in Kispiox, there was something that happened while they were building it. The inner lining was nailed with the nails left sticking out about a quarter of an inch. This way, after the shiplap boards dried out, the nails could be pulled out and the boards pushed together tight and re-nailed. This made the house less drafty. There was only a couple of boards from the top row and Uncle Jonathan, tired from all the hammering, he knew that a lot of men were down at the store sitting around the stove whittling and talking. So he put the bag of nails over the top board and let it fall in the corner beside a window opening. He told Dad that he ran out of nails and had to go to Hazleton to get more. Dad knew that they still had nails and he looked all over for them. He never found them until later after the house was finished after the house was finished, we moved into Prince Rupert for a couple of years and then moved to Terrace. Uncle Jonathan was horseback riding, hunting with shoes that had very little heels from the wear. The horse smelled a uh, bear, jumped in fear, and bolted down the trail. Uncle Jonathan's foot slipped through the stirrup and he was thrown off the saddle with the first jump forward. The horse jerked his leg. This dislocated his hip, even though he didn't know it at the time. He went for about two years in pain. Finally bedridden, they called a doctor from Hazleton who didn't know what the cause of his fever was. Then they called an Indian woman from Prince George, a doctor in her own right. She felt his body with her wrist. This is more sensitive to temperature change. The temperature in his hip area was higher than anywhere else. He got two men to hold his upper body, and one of the men put his feet to get it. man on the side was hurt. He pulled the leg real hard at the right time and shoved his hip with her palm. A sickening scream couldn't be held back as a snap sound came from the hip. 
he passed out. Two days later, she checked again and said, I'm sorry, but the hip is sick. There's nothing more that I can do for you. She left and went back to Prince George. Unfortunately, cancer had set in. Two years later, after a hellish fight, Uncle Jonathan was near the end. Dad sensed Jonathan's condition brought us kids up to say goodbye. When we arrived in front of the house, Dad said, You kids remember, there is a terrible smell when someone is dying from cancer. Don't make a face or sounds that will hurt his feelings. This is your way of showing respect. It will be your gift for him to remember in his tough time. We went in and Dad was right. The smell was terrible. He knelt down in front of Jonathan since the sickness had all his neck muscles emancipated to the point of not being able to hold his head up. He said, we came up to say goodbye since I have to work and I don't know if the old car could make it again. Do the best that you can and God bless you into the next life. Uncle Johnson summoned up his strength and said, Samhachtoyasen, I really salute you. You've really trained your children well. Not one of them has made a face or sound of disgust. This he said without looking up. My own family runs in, packs me out of bed and onto this chair and runs out again. Then they run in and put the plate of food on my lap and run out again. They can't stand it. I heard him say to dad, later I will be reborn through my eldest daughter, Louise. It came to me in a dream. You will tell a couple from up the valley that when a train carrying six children arrives in Hazleton, they will adopt a baby. When I turn 13, you will teach me how to make snowshoes. Your son Jackie will be the timer of when to do these things. He told Dad more, but my mind was reeling with the responsibility that he placed on me. Each one of us knelt down in front of Jonathan and said our goodbyes and how proud we were to know him. My older brother said, Uncle, it's like the sun is going down, since when he visited us in Hazleton, he always played his guitar while walking down the road to our house, singing, You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. We nicknamed him Sunshine. When my turn came, I said, Uncle, we will really miss you. Your laughter and strength gave us all strength. He stopped me with a slight hand gesture. Son, you will see me again. When I return, you will make sure it is me, and you will time the events that will shape my next life so I will continue on the right path. Within a year of knowing of my return, you will tell Percy it is time to tell the people to get ready for my arrival to Kispiox, and when I am 13, you will tell them it is time to teach me how to make snowshoes. I will carry on from there with what I need to know that will tie me to the earth on my journey. After Jonathan died, no one could live in the house. There would be banging sounds on all four walls as if someone was hitting the walls with their clenched hands. Dad went up to Kispiox and tore the house down. He found a bag of nails between the shiplap and the corner beside the window. I didn't realize that it didn't matter where we were in life. We would fit into his plan as necessary. A few years went by and Louise had five kids and had an operation to stop having children. They tied her tubes. She then began living with a white guy called Jackson Anderson. Jonathan had told Dad he was going to be born half white. She got pregnant. Apparently the tubes had come loose and they had to operate to allow her to have the baby. They moved into a trailer 
on old Peterson Road. I had moved to Campbell River and got work in the Elk Falls pulp mill. Since the banks wouldn't lend me or an Indian money for a mortgage, I had to build my own house, which I did on the corner of Peterson and Willis. Luckily, I learned how to build a house from my father. My dad, Percy, seemed to always show up just when I was stuck with a carpentry problem. In a few minutes, he would show me my mistake and how to fix it. He was a perfectionist carpenter. A kind lady loans officer at the Campbell River Credit Union gave me a $10,000 first mortgage after I built the house to the roof. I then got a $5,000 government second mortgage. With these two loans, I was able to finish the inside of the house. Then I subdivided the property into four lots and sold the other three lots to pay off most of the loans and finish the house. Willis Road turned into Old Peterson Road at that corner, so Louise and her husband only lived about one block from me on Old Peterson Road. She had a baby boy, and about two and a half years later, she came over to my house and told me that the baby was singing Jonathan's songs in the morning. I had all but forgotten that he said that he would be reincarnated through his eldest daughter. I asked her to bring the baby over early in the morning while he was still asleep. Then I called Dad and asked him about things that only happened between him and Jonathan. He recalled the story about the bag of nails which he found when he tore the house down. Louise brought the baby over sleeping and we had coffee until the baby woke up. Sure enough, he started singing songs. Not all the words, but enough to know the tunes. I asked him, what's your name? He said, Jonathan. It didn't matter that it was really Joey. I said, Percy Sterrett had four boys. Do you remember their names? He thought and said, Mops, which is Marvin, Jackie, Dusty, which is Vince, and Sandy, which is Simon. What was their names for you, I asked. Sunshine, he answered, because I sang, You Are My Sunshine, on my way to visit them. You had a house in Kispiox that you and Percy built. Do you remember the difference between it and the other houses in Kispiox? He really thought and then said, We put shiplap on the inside as well as on the outside of the walls. Double line. It was really warm. What did you do while you were nailing the inside shiplap to be able to go to Hazelton instead of working? I asked. He thought for a while and said, I threw the bag of nails over the top of the boards in the corner of the room beside the window. Percy found it when he tore down the house. This find was after Johnson was dead. No one could live in the house because I was hitting the walls with my hands all night. I went and got the little guitar that I owned and I came back to Joey and knelt in front of him and said, Jonathan, this is for all the enjoyment you gave us when we were young. Young as he was, he took the guitar and wrapped his little fingers around the neck and began strumming with his other hand. Louise began singing, and she had a beautiful voice. We all began crying. Jonathan was back. I phoned Dad in Terrace and told him that the little boy had all the answers, including about the nails. It was only about two weeks later that Louise had a heart attack and died. She must have known instinctively that something was going wrong while she absolutely had to make sure that Jonathan was recognized. The next summer, I went fishing with my dad, which I did during my summer holidays from the pulp mill. When we went into the Prince Rupert eating at a restaurant, I suddenly felt that time was right to tell the people about Jonathan and their part in it to play in his new life. After telling Dad, he said, I don't even know where these people are, so how can I complete my part? Dolphus Morgan was walking by, and I asked him where these people might be. 
He said, they're having a family reunion in the back room here. My dad and I walked into the back room, a larger part of the restaurant. I clapped my hands together and said, sorry, everybody, we're not crashing the party, but dad needs to talk to some of you about the reincarnation of Uncle Jonathan and his future. They went quiet and puzzled. It only took a few minutes for Dad to tell each person about their part as told to him by Jonathan years before. When he got to the couple who were to adopt him as a baby, they were shocked and a bit embarrassed. We're only dating and not even married. Dad said, that doesn't matter. I was told by Jonathan that you would adopt a baby named Joey. It's only my job to tell you. A few months later, after a heroic effort, Jackson Anderson just couldn't raise a family by himself. His income was too low, and even with the help of the eldest child, he had to give up. He bought one-way tickets for them all and put them on the train for Hazleton. The people from Kispiox met the train, and the couple who were now married adopted the boy. Other families took the other children as Dad instructed them to. A few years went by, and Mom and Dad split up. Dad left Mom the family house and moved into a little trailer in Kispiox his home village. Later, he bought a lot from the village and built a house on it. Then I remembered that Dad was to teach Joey how to make snowshoes. I phoned him and reminded him about this last job. He was, after all, teaching a snowshoe class in Kispiox. He said, I don't even know where he lives. How am I going to find him? I said, all you can do is look for the couple that adopted him. Later that week, he called back and informed me that they were living two houses away from his house. He took Joey into his next class. He was now 13, as he told me, when he wanted to learn to make snowshoes. After a year, they all had made a pair to be graded. Joey put his snowshoes next to Dad's snowshoes, and Billy Blackwater picked Joey's pair to be Dad's. They were so perfect, complete with little pom-poms along the outer edges. Everyone was very impressed. Joey has now gone on to complete his destiny armed with the necessary knowledge of the past. Dad had passed on. You see, a lot of our lives are predestined. Most of us don't know it as clearly as a shaman like Uncle Jonathan. Dad and I, the other people who were to play a part in his new life, had our destiny shaped to include his with or without our knowledge. Mm -hmm.